And John Suat would sometimes take note of the fact that there are a lot of things in your experience that the Buddha tells you to say are not self. You apply the perception of not self to your body. And as he said, if your body isn't yours, then your loved ones aren't yours either, really. And it goes out to a lot of other things, too. And then, of course, in the mind, your feelings, your perceptions, thought constructs, even your consciousness is not really yours. But then there's that passage that we chant often, I am the owner of my actions. That, he says, is one area where you don't want to apply the perception of not-self too early. Because what you're doing makes a difference between whether you're creating the cause of suffering or putting together the path to its end. You've got to be responsible for that. There are choices you make. And it's nothing that just happens on its own, that you naturally just watch things and everything goes into the path. Sometimes you can watch things and they can turn into something else entirely. You've got to make choices. You see this in so many of the teachings. When the Buddha talks about the qualities you bring to mindfulness and concentration, there's mindfulness, keeping something in mind, alertness, watching what you're doing, and then ardency, putting your whole heart into doing it well. Notice that alertness here is not just being aware of the present moment. And we've got consciousness in the present moment all the time. Whether we're paying attention to that or paying attention to something else, the consciousness in the present moment is here. Alertness is more focused. It's focused on what you're doing, either outside or in the mind. Because that's what makes all the difference. So we're not here because the present moment is a wonderful moment, but because there's work to be done. And the work that makes the difference is done right here. Now in figuring out what to do, in other words, figuring out what the duty of ardency is, there's another quality that lies in the background. That's appropriate attention. That asks the questions, what's skillful, what's not skillful? And from there it goes into something that's implied by those questions. In other words, if there's something skillful, there's got to be a skillful cause that leads to a desirable result and an unskillful cause that leads to an undesirable result. Right there you've got the framework for the Four Noble Truths. And as the Buddha explains appropriate attention many, many times, that's the framework that's applied. The Four Noble Truths and their duties. We chanted the Dhammajaka the other night, and you notice the part that was the wheel, which is the heart of the sutta where the Buddha talks about knowing each truth and then knowing the duty with regard to that truth and then knowing that you completed it. Appropriate attention is a matter of the first two levels of knowledge there, knowing what the truth is and then knowing what the duty is. And then ardency is what tries to bring about that third level. So how do you use the Four Noble Truths? You look at things in terms of what are you doing, what are the results. If the results are leading to stress, okay, you're doing something unskillful. You might want to look into what you're doing and see if you can change. There's going to be desire in both sides. There's, there are desires that lead to suffering, and there are desires that help get the path together. You can't just say, well, I'll just give up desires. You have to figure out which kind of desire is it. Is, the, is it the desire that should be encouraged, or is it the desire that should be discouraged? And to see that, you've got to get the mind really quiet. I mean, there's no way you're going to be able to apply these things in, with a lot of detail unless the mind is very quiet. I mean, you can start out in the beginning, looking at things that are obviously stressful and asking yourself, why do I have to keep doing this? Sometimes it's out of the force of habit. Sometimes there's even a sense that you should be weighing the mind down in certain ways. And other times it's for entertainment. 
You have to sort out what are the reasons for doing something that leads to distress. What can you do to stop? Well, one of the things you can do is to get the mind into concentration. It keeps coming back to concentration. Insight without concentration doesn't work all that well. It can get to certain levels of insight into things and develop dispassion for certain things going on in the mind and certain ways of acting. But to get really detailed, you've got to get everything very, very quiet. It's like listening to a, or listening for a sound in the house. Say there's mice in the walls, you think, you suspect. But if you've got the stereo blur blaring and you've got the TV on and you've got the internet and the re refrigerator's on, you're not going to hear the mice. You've got to turn everything off. Get everything in the house as quiet as possible. And you have to sit as quietly as possible because just moving around in the house. You hear a floorboard creak. Well, it may be you causing the creak. So you've got to get the mind still. Now, wrestling the mind down into stillness. Sometimes you encounter weird things going on in your body. A lot of issues around rapture come here. But you want to sort through those. And you allow the rapture to happen. If it's too much, let it go out the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, out your eyes, out your ears. What are we visualizing it exiting the body if it's too strong? But don't be afraid of it. Often the fact that the rapture comes is something you want to use, because once the mind is fed well with a sense of good energy, and many times that's what the rapture can be. It's, if it doesn't feel good, it's like pumping water into the system of a house where the pipes are poorly connected. Pressure will build up here, it might build up there, because there are blockages. If you can sort things out and open up all the channels, then the energy will flow smoothly. If the rapture is needed, it will do its work, and then it will subside. It gives you some nourishment, and then you can really calm things down. And that's when you can look more deeply at these Four Noble Truths. What do they apply to? Well, the hindrances, for instance, those are, those are part of the cause of suffering. So those are things you want to abandon. And appropriate attention has the duty of looking into the things that would normally give rise to the hindrances, say, like lust or ill will, and learning to look at them in a way that cuts the hindrance off. This is one of the reasons why we have the reflection on the 32 parts of the body, why we have the chants on the four Brahmaviharas, is to give yourself a new attitude toward the things that would ordinarily get you worked up either into lust or into ill will. So you can see that it's not really worth getting involved in those mind states. And things that normally would trigger them, you can learn to look at them in a new way. Say that you don't have to respond to them in that way. This is what a lot of this is, is seeing that you're free to respond in new ways from a different perspective. So whatever way you can think that would make the object of your lust not so desirable or the object of your anger and ill will not quite so irritating. Learn to look at it in those ways. And you'll be putting appropriate attention into action. In other words, it becomes a guide for ardency. So you really can put an end to the ways you're causing suffering for yourself. Similarly with the factors for awakening. Those are things that correspond with the path. Those are things you want to develop. So what does develop mindfulness? What develops analysis of qualities. One of the things the Buddha said is, look at what you're doing, seeing what's skillful and what's not. And then you put some effort into doing things that are skillful and abandoning what's not. That's how you get the rapture and then the calm. Again, here's that pattern. You feed the body, you feed the mind with rapture, and then once they're fed, then the rapture is no longer needed and it can subside. 
Just don't bottle it up. And this way you get the mind out of the hindrances and get it onto the path. This where another passage where the Buddha talks about appropriate attention is looking at the five aggregates. Where you're going to see them, well, you're going to see them in your concentration. Or you can see them as you leave concentration, or as you go from one level of concentration to another. These activities of the mind. You can't determine ahead of time which one is going to be the one that's going to spark insight. That one, the one that's going to hit you. And say that you've been holding on to this particular way of doing things, or this particular way of feeling or perceiving, thinking, whatever. And all of a sudden it strikes you that what you thought was your friend is not your friend. What you thought you could rely on, you can't rely on. So you can't determine ahead of time which of the aggregates is going to be the trigger, or which of the perceptions that you apply. Because the clinging aggregates are, as the Buddha said, the first noble truth, and that's something to be comprehended. In other words, something that you should comprehend until you develop this passion for it, that kind of comprehension. This is where he brings into what are usually called the three characteristics. It's in the canon they call them perceptions. There's the perception of inconstancy, the perception of stress, perception of not self. They're never called characteristics. The sutta we have, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the name there is not in the canon. It's something that was applied later. These are perceptions that you apply to these things. So as to get a sense of dispassion. One way is when the mind gets really still, and you're really good at keeping it still, you can begin to see, okay, what am I doing to keep the concentration together? We've got the form of the body, you've got the feeling of ease, you've got the perception, say, of the breath that holds you here, you've got the directed thought and evaluation, those are the sankharas or fabrications. And then there's your consciousness of all these things. So it's like you've roped the five aggregates into one place where you can watch them, and you've been making good use of them. They allow you to apply the three characteristics or the three perceptions to other things outside. Because when the mind gets still, you can see a lot of things you didn't see before. In terms of how and why the mind focuses on something and lays claim to something, thinking that it will give rise to ease and well-being. But if you've got the greater ease of concentration, you begin to see that's not the case. That's what allows you to let these things go. And it can either be through seeing them as inconstant or perceiving them as stressful, not self. Whatever hits home. And then you can turn on the concentration itself, because it too is made out of these aggregates. You can start taking that apart. And again, you don't know which of the three characteristics or three perceptions is going to be the one that really hits you, or which particular activity. In the forest tradition, they focus a lot on perception, because the labels we apply to things really color everything else in the mind. So you might want to start with that. And see if there's some way that you can develop this passion for the things that you're clinging to. So this principle of appropriate attention starts with ordinary, everyday issues of skillful and unskillful action and moves deeper and deeper inside. It's always a question, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? If you can see that there's stress, do you have another alternative? There was someone from Singapore one time who's just gotten introduced to some of John Lee's writings and wrote a letter to us at the, at the monastery in, in Riong. He was talking about his meditation practice, which was he was learning to apply the three perceptions to everything as in the course of the day. And then John Fuang told me to write back to him and say, look, it's, the issue is not the inconstancy of things out there, it's the inconstancy in your own mind. Don't go blaming other things for being inconstant, stressful, not self. The things you're clinging to in the mind. 
the mind itself that's saying, in constant stress, I'm not self. That can be the part of the problem. So you've got to look all around. But you have to look all around in stages. And the reason we apply these perceptions is they're value judgments. So we can focus on the things that will give rise to dispassion. They're tools for fulfilling the duties we have with regard to the Four Noble Truths. So as the Buddha said, appropriate attention is the primary internal quality that can lead to awakening. There's nothing that's more useful. You ask the right questions and you get the right answers. If you ask the wrong questions, then no matter how many answers you get, none of them will work. So right now the question is what? How can you get the mind to settle down? How can you develop the qualities of the path? Work on that. And keep these other questions in the back of your mind. What's skillful right now? What's not skillful? What am I doing? And what's it connected to in terms of the stress or ease I feel? And John Lee once said, we can see the results, but if we don't see the causes, it's not insight. Or we can see the causes, but not the results, that's not insight either. You have to see the connection between what you're doing and the level of stress that's happening. and how you can stop doing whatever's causing the stress. That's insight. So it all starts with this quality of alertness, coupled with ardency, looking at what you're doing and trying your best to do it right.